Uh, probably. There we go. Yeah, it's never the sound guy's fault. It's always the guy up here, you know? Um, all right, well, I hope your, your cup is getting fuller and fuller. Hopefully it's not so full we, you can't take anything more in. Um, that's the hope. Um, and uh, if, if, uh, if that happens, just come talk to me. I'll send you my sermon notes, and you can digest them later, okay? Because um, sometimes that's how my brain works. So we've looked at missional living um, really begins with loving Christ, all right? That was last night. Um, and so just we've we got to be clear there. We, we, we've got to love Jesus, saints. We've got to love Jesus. We've got to love him more. And we talked last night how really everything in this world is distracting us from loving Christ, right? That's just the constant pull of the flesh. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where um, you'll, get, you'll get into something that's really silly and foolish, but it'll distract you, all right? So I told you last night I like biking. Um, I have a great bike. I don't need another bike. But I'll get sucked into this, 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 I call it the scroll hole, of looking at new bikes. And then for days, I'm thinking about if I sell my bike for this much, if I sell this for that much, I can get a new bike. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. And it's like, and then the Lord's like, I, I talk to myself in third person, Schroeder, what are you doing? You're an idiot. You've been wasting time and thought on this, this, this thing. You don't even need it. You've already got one that fits you perfectly. And it's not broke. So why are you trying to fix it? And, and I just, so, and honestly, I see that as just my flesh coming back up, distracting me from something that's more important. And, I, and, and it's like, what is going on here? And I'm like, I think this world, the flesh, and the devil, it's always pulling me away from just love Christ most, love Christ more, right? And that can happen with silly things like my bike. It can happen with good things like my family. It can even happen with God things like ministry. We can just lose affection for Christ. We can lose love for Christ, right? And that's what God's after. He's after our affections. He wants our souls to be stirred constantly, right? And so like we talked last night, we can't lean back on, oh man, 10 years ago, I really loved Jesus. Okay, that's great. How about today, right? How are we doing today? I mean, it's like a couple that comes in for marriage counseling and they just say, Pastor, we don't love each other anymore. And maybe, maybe they might even go so far to say, we never did. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Because at one point you got married, which tells me you did love each other. And something happened over time that you've drifted. I think for Christians, we can do the same thing, can't we? We can go from loving Christ to drifting, right? So we got to hold on to this, love Christ love him, pursue him, um, and that goes back to why we daily, daily pursue him, daily preach the gospel to yourself, uh, be in churches like this that proclaim the gospel with clarity from all of scripture, because our hearts need to be warmed to Christ, all right? So that was last night. Then a few minutes ago, right, gospel fluency, gospel fluency. If we're going to live on mission, we've got to be fluent in the gospel. Um, we cannot try to, or we can't talk about that which, that which we don't know. All right? So praise God for affection. Praise God for just youthful zeal. I love Jesus. Great. So that's that the place to start. Now, let's, let's know him better. All right? And, and we're going to get here later on today, but it's not so that we can win arguments. God is not impressed with you winning arguments. It's not about you proving your opponent wrong. It's about you being able to articulate gospel realities. Right, that people would actually hear the truth of the gospel through your lips, right? So we want to be fluent in the gospel. Um, but now, this session, we're going to actually, I'm going to, it's kind of one of those God just began convicting me in the last several days as I was just praying and studying that in order to be gospel fluent, we must be gospel transformed, all right? Now, I know this is, this is on mission, all right? We're talking about mission, but I think that we've actually done the gospel a disservice by not living lives that are conformed to the gospel. All right, so we'll get there in just a minute. Let me back up. The best salesmen are the ones who believe in their product. Would you agree? Maybe you've done sales. If you don't believe in your product, you're probably not going to stay there very long. It's hard to get excited about that which you don't believe in. I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had guys come to my door and and they're trying to sell me something, and I'm sure they're decent human beings, and I commend them for having a job, but it's quite obvious they don't want to be there. Do you ever have those guys? They're often young kids, and they're selling something, and you're like, dude, what are you doing? 
I mean, I actually told a kid, I was like, you know what? I know you're probably trying to raise money for college. I'll just give you 20 bucks. I, I just want to support you, but I don't care about what you're selling. It's lame. <laughs> There's no reason to buy this. But then, you've, then you've ever, you've, you've, when you meet somebody who really believes in their thing, I mean, they believe in it so much that they think every human being would benefit from it. I mean, my, my, my joke is with my friends who do CrossFit, because the joke is if you have a friend who does CrossFit, you know you have a friend who does CrossFit. They're fanatics about it. They love it. It's like they're at 4 a.m. at the gym every day, beating their bodies to death. They're like, dude, what are you doing? But you know they do it, and they think all y'all should do it. No matter how old you are, you should do it. No matter how bad it hurts, you should do it. Or maybe you've got that friend who's, you know, he's really into the healthy eating thing, you know, the paleo, vegan, keto, whatever people. You're like, just eat and enjoy life. No way, man. You know what that's doing to your body? I don't care. It just tastes great. But you're into it, and you think everybody should be into it. And there's a, something about that I appreciate, because they're passionate about that which has transformed their lives. And so they honestly make good salesmen, even if they're not making money off of it. And when it comes to missional living, brothers and sisters, if we have not been people that are radically transformed by the gospel, you'll have very little zeal to ever talk about the gospel. And frankly, when you do, it's going to come off like that salesman at your front door that you're like, dude, get another job. Because this one ain't working for you. To use the words of Jesus, when you've been forgiven much, you love much. And when you love much, you talk much about what you love. But if Jesus is, is as about exciting to you as yesterday's news, then living on mission for Jesus will be a duty and not a delight. If, if Jesus hasn't transformed you, if he's not the delight of your soul and what has transformed every aspect of your life, talking about him is not going to be what jazzes you up. And so if, if you will, I'd like to try this, this in this next 30, 35 minutes. Are we done at 11 on this one? I steal time for myself, and that's the problem. So we're going to try to just discern our hearts a little bit. And so this might feel more like an, a session going after our souls. But I think it's important because sometimes we just go, okay, help me live on mission. And so we're thinking about those people out there, but our hearts are a wreck. And if our hearts are a wreck, we're actually the problem. There's actually a, a crazy, we're not going to get into this. Remember when Jesus said that he said, I can't do miracles in that town. Yeah. That's an interesting phrase. Remember why? No faith. no faith. And if we connect faith with last session, faith is life on God's terms. Living a life for the glory of God. And actually all over scripture, different sermon, different talk, but all over scripture we see that God, God is with those who walk by faith. Old Testament, they would say things like God is with us, Right? New Testament, oh, the effective, fervent, prayer of a righteous man, as much power as it's working. God's with those who walk with him. Maybe our evangelism lacks power because we're not walking with God. So you're like, oh yeah, I got all the right, I got the slick of presentation, I've got the, I'm going out and evangelizing, I'm giving out tracts, I'm doing this, but it's falling flat. Maybe we got to do the work of our own hearts. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look into our hearts a little bit, but don't worry, it's going to actually, it's going to lead us to mission. It's going to lead us to mission. All right, let's see here. You know, one of the greatest attacks on the Christian church today in America is this. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you've said it. Maybe, it's, maybe it was you, maybe it is you. The church is full of hypocrites. Hey, look at there, you know it too. <laughs> see, people who claim to be followers of Jesus on Sunday, but live as lovers of the world Monday through Saturday. And, and rightfully so, the diagnosis of the world is, y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. And when that is true, it's a tool of Satan to discourage the masses from even listening to the gospel. Now, we know that all people will stand before God on their own two feet. But God forbid they can look at you and say, I'm not a Christian because of you. Right? God forbid that that be any of us. That we're the obstacle of somebody coming to faith in Jesus. And if we're not joyfully living for Jesus from hearts that are transformed and captivated by Christ, then when we talk about Jesus, if we talk about Jesus, why in the world would they want what we have? If our lives are a wreck, if our, if our lives look just like the world, and we say you should believe in Jesus, why? You're no different than me. 
You see, our lives, the tri our lives, as we'll see here in a moment, should display gospel light. Our, how we live, how we structure our schedules, everything about us should display the light of Christ. And so that when we talk about the light of Christ, people aren't like, really, you're a Christian? You've got to be kidding me. No one should be like, duh. Yeah, I knew something was different about you because your life looks like Christ. And so if we're going to be gospel fluent people, we must be the kind of people that not just know the gospel, we must be people that are shaped by the gospel. We must be people that live by the gospel. And so to use Jesus' words, we're going to try to talk about light and darkness. Because that's how Jesus defines this life in the book of John. So if you're familiar with these categories of light and darkness, throughout Scripture, there are references light would stand for righteousness, and darkness is for what? Sin and unrighteousness, right? So this is just all throughout the Bible. This is kind of these, this, this Bible imagery, if you will, light and darkness. So Jesus picks it up in John chapter 1, actually, or John does in John chapter 1, and from the very giddy-up, he's going to talk about light and darkness. And then this motif of light and darkness is going to show up all over John's gospel, and it's, it's not just positional. It's practical. Do you live in the light? So, yes, we know the light, that's position, but in your practice, do you live in the light? So let's look at John 1, verse 5 and verse 9. If you have a Bible, you can, you can go there. John 1, 5, to know Jesus is to know the light. There was a man sent from God, or I'm sorry, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This light is so glorious that no darkness can rival it. No darkness can overcome it. Overcome it. Jesus, as this light, is, is talked about 24 times in John's gospel alone. It's the idea of a pure, brilliant light. All right? It's literally, it's, it's a different word for light than we see in other places in Scripture. It's not a flicker of light. It's like the morning sunrise light. It's not a dollar store flashlight kind of light. It's like that, you know, $100 flashlight that's like some zillion lumens. It blinds you. That's the light being talked about here. It's a brilliant light. It's a light that you can't ignore. It's like when you're at the dentist chair and he turns that thing on over your head. You're like, come on, man, what are you doing? It's a light that's unignorable. This light, this light is shining. Did you see it in verse 5? The light is shining. It's a present active verb. It is shining. Not it has shined. The light is right now every day. The light is shining and it's the reason for which Christ came, to shine into the darkness. You see, the light, of this, the, 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 the light of Christ is the very thing the enemy of God does not want all people to see. 2 Corinthians 4, one of my favorite texts. should be one of yours too. The God of this world, what? Blinds the, the eyes, the minds, the unbelievers from seeing what? The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So what's he trying to do? Just keep them blind. Because if they see the light, they come to the light. If they see the beauty of Jesus, they're drawn to him. So keep them blind. So we see this literally cosmic war. Christ's light, the enemy of God, blind the eyes. That's where we're at. John 12, 4, 20, John 12, 46. Jesus says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. So simply put, when you believe in Jesus, darkness is no longer your reality, right? And we don't mean light like some enlightenment kind of thinking like, oh yeah, I've come to the light. You can come to the light too. That's not what we're doing. This is Christ is the light and I was in darkness and he burst into my soul and now I can see. Right, that's the kind of light we're talking about here. But notice in verse 5 how it finishes, light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The enemy of God, this darkness, has fought since the beginning to overcome the light. Hear this, saints, this is not a lack of understanding, it's an all-out rebellion. And in my, when I preached this text uh, years ago, we just went through how the enemy of God, the devil, has worked so hard to stamp out this light, all the way back to Cain killing Abel. Yeah. I mean, you look at what he's tried to stamp out Israel so that the Messiah couldn't come, all the way to the killing of Christ on the cross. I truly believe that Satan, for that moment, thought, I won. I stamped out the light, right? It's gone. 
His, 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 his aim has always been to overcome, to stamp out, to overthrow the light. But darkness can't overcome it. Why? Because Jesus won. Right? Jesus won. I mean, one of, again, one of my all-time favorite verses is Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. He disarmed rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. That's it. Darkness cannot overcome it. And this is actually good news for us as we think about mission. Jesus won. The darkness cannot overcome the light. You know, I get so tired of American, especially California Christians, just bagging on society. Oh my gosh, can you believe how wicked our state is? Of course you can. They're in darkness. What do you expect? That's it. Case closed. Next. They need Jesus. Don't, don't watch the news expecting for them to be light. Expect darkness to act like darkness. So then what do we do? We live on mission. Because we have the one thing all people need. Their problem's not their politics. The problem's not their taxes. The problem is they don't have light. And they're running against Christ. So we're just like, yeah, par for the course. Life this side of heaven. What do we do? Paul, preach Christ. Lift him up. He's the light. <coughs> darkness, darkness cannot and will not overcome it. The resurrection proved it. Jesus won. So to know Jesus is to know the light. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged by that. This little book, Honest Evangelism, you should buy it. It's on sale for $100 in the bookstore, right, Chris? There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be great. Um, it, uh, he, he, he addresses this. And actually, that's the, I believe it's the motivation that gets me to cross into the unbeliever and say, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Because my team already won. So even if they reject me, I still won. It hurts a little bit. But, the, but Christ won. And I'm in Christ, so I'm good. So to know Jesus is to know light. That's our position, all right? But we need to look at how to know Jesus is to walk in the light. So I think sometimes we stop there. You know, I, I, um, I am of the Reformed tradition, you might say. And so I love the doctrines of justification by faith alone. You should too. But I think one of the problems with the Reformed tradition is we like to talk about our position and not our practice. We just like to talk about, oh, praise God, I'm secure in Jesus, and you're living like a hellion. God's not impressed. Because your position should actually be matched by your practice. Correct? You should shake your head yes. <laughs> Our position does not excuse bad practice. We don't live like the devil and claim to be positioned in Christ. So if we know the light, guess what we should do? We should walk in the light. All right? So let's just break this down a little bit. John chapter 3, verse 21 I told you John 3 is an important one, okay? Just want to keep a little tab in your Bible there. We're, gonna, we're just going to be there over and over. John 3, verse 21. To know Jesus is to walk in the light. Believing in Jesus looks like, you ready for this? Believing in Jesus, faith in Jesus, looks like doing what is true. Whoever does what is true, John 3, 21, comes to the light. Interesting it says it that way. Because doing what is true is a reference to your faith. You've done what is true. You've sided with God. You're doing life on God's terms. You're doing what is true, and you've come to the light. So believing in Jesus looks like doing what is true. See, Jesus is instilled in this talk about being born again. And when you're born again, it always results, without exception, in a transformed life. And just remember... The transformed life is not the basis of your acceptance before God, but it's because you have been accepted by God, you live a transformed life. So you are, you are now in the light, and you're walking out light. It's what defines you. It's the sphere of your living, as Jesus would say later, abiding in him. And one author said it this way, when we don't walk in the light and we claim to believe in the light, we are functional gospel deniers. Sure, we can all day long say, I love Jesus, but we're denying with our actions. I mean, to use a, a, a harsh example, it's like a father who beats his children. But then he says, oh, I love you, son. Where does that kid grow up remembering? 
What's he remembering? Being, being beat. They don't remember a father who says, oh, I love you, son. They remember what he did to them. Right? So we can say all day long, I love Jesus. But the proof is in the pudding. Does your, does your practice prove your position or does your practice deny your position? Because if your practice denies your position, there's no category for you in Scripture but unbeliever. Your position always affects your practice every time without exception. John, or Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, a verse I quoted earlier, good works to the glory of God. They do not earn the favor of God, but they are the result of you knowing the favor of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we all love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but we so often stop before verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, come on, tell me, for good works, which God prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, good Calvinist. We love to talk about predestined before the foundation of the world. Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, I've been chosen before time. Great, wonderful. For good works. You submitting your life to the will and ways of God, denying yourself, taking up your cross, following Jesus. That's what you were prepared for. Right? So don't celebrate eternity while you live carnally in the present. Right? You are redeemed for good works, that we would glorify God by walking out this life of light. You see, when you're born again, these good deeds are now empowered by the true, or by the Spirit of God that is at work, that is at work in you. You no longer, you're no longer, self, you're no longer performing in self-righteousness. You're no longer covering up a few bad deeds with a few good deeds. We're not people that believe in karma. I really blew it today, so I got to be better tomorrow. That's not how we're operating as Christians. But we do believe that a transformed heart is demonstrated by a transformed life. And the Bible calls that good deeds for the glory of God. So I get to live for God. Why? Because I've come to the light. I've come to the light. And now I get to live in the sphere of that light. And so this gospel is indeed the good news to those who believe, and this gospel does indeed transform all those who believe. Do you know there's no such thing as a Christian who's not transformed? It doesn't exist. You can't find one in the Bible. Somebody who's a follower of Christ but not following. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. So we've created this whole category in modern Christianity. We call it the carnal Christian. It's like you can just stay there forever. But that's not how God defines it. No, you're unrepentant, and you should repent and believe. You're hard-hearted, and you should stop being hard-hearted. If you have come to the light of Christ, you should live like it. And this is all over our Bibles. So this gospel that saves is this gospel that transforms. And brothers and sisters, if you know the light of Christ, you should display the light of Christ. Our, we should be the kind of people that the world can look on and say, even if I don't agree, there's something different. We're going to talk later about 1 Peter chapter 3. The hope that's within you should radiate. Yeah, you should be the best neighbor. Not so that everybody likes you on your block, but because Christ is shining through you. You should sacrificially serve those around you because that's what Jesus has done for you. You should die to sin and love your enemy and do good to those who hate you, like that neighbor who really annoys everybody, especially you. Yeah, love your enemy. And everybody's going to go, how do you love them? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Because your life is rich with good works for the glory of God. That when you talk about your faith, people aren't going, nah, there's no way you're a Christian. You see, this whole living on mission can't be separated from our life. Right? We can't be functional gospel deniers and then open our mouth and speak of Christ. We're fooling nobody. John chapter 8, verse 12. Following Jesus looks like not walking in darkness. And Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, light and darkness, they're far more than positional realities. They are immensely practical. Did you hear the words of Christ? They, I mean, it's one of those passages that almost needs no explanation. It just hits you right there between the eyes. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me, they will not. They will not walk in darkness. And again, we know darkness is, is, is that like Jesus speak for unrighteousness. They won't be like the world. 
because you're no longer of the world. You've been given a new heart, right? New affections, new desires. You know, this actually really encourages me. There's a, there's a variety of things in my life that, that um, assure me of my salvation. I know the spirit internally is where we would go scripturally, but I think there's also things like fruit. And there's things in my life where I'm like, wow, Lord, I know that I'm yours because I don't desire what I used to desire. And it's not because of self-reform. It's because Christ is doing a work. And I'm now loving what he loves and hating what he hates. Now, there's a lot of areas I'm not reformed yet in. He's still chiseling things off. He's changing me. He's making me more like Christ. But whenever I, whenever I see evidences of light in my life, I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm yours. I'm loving the light. I don't love darkness anymore. That's an evidence of grace at work. The gospel is taking root and bearing fruit in my life. Brothers and sisters, I think it'd be good for us to be honest with our souls. Do we claim to walk in the, do we claim to know the light and yet walk in darkness? If so, we're actually, we're we're hypocrites at that point. And we're functional gospel deniers. And I'm not saying God can't use you to evangelize, but I'm saying um, your evangelism will be at best stifled and stunted because you don't really love Christ and your life proves it. You love yourself, you love the things of this world, you don't love Christ. Well, just one more verse in case you're not convinced yet. John chapter 12, verse 46, following Jesus looks like not remaining in darkness. John 12, verse 46, another reference, Jesus would say this, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And when you walk in the light, according to John 15, 5, you're abiding in Christ and you will bear fruit and that fruit looks like Christ. I mean, this is where I believe Jesus would. Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. You need him. You need him to walk with him. So positionally, we're connected to the light. Practically, we stay connected to the light. Why? Because apart from him, we got nothing. I can't be a godly husband. I can't be a godly father. I can't kill sin. And I definitely can't take the gospel to my neighbors apart from Christ powerfully at work within me. Right? I mean, have you ever tried to live the Christian life in your own strength? Shake your head. You've done it. And then you fail. And you're like, what's going on, Lord? And you realize, ah, yeah, I've been trying to do this whole walking with God thing on my own. It doesn't work. We're just moralists at that point. Okay, do better next time. Do better next time. Do better next time. No, no, you're, you're in the light. Now, now walk in the light. Just abide in Christ. Stay in the sphere of the light of Christ and let him powerfully work in you. That's where we see the cooperation with the spirit of God. We're not running from God. No, we're walking with him. And he's powerfully at work within us, conforming us to Christ, causing us to love him and, and hate sin. As we do that, we begin to bear fruit. And so, brothers and sisters, it's so easy for us to talk about even things like missional living, and we can focus on those out there who need Jesus, but not addressing the simple truth that the way we live our life either declares that Christ is life or that he's not. So does your life declare that Christ is life? Now, there's this old phrase, and I don't agree with it, but it was, you know, um, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. It's not a great phrase, because the gospel's a message. But I will say this, if you're using words and your life denies the gospel, stop talking and focus on your heart and walk with Jesus before you open your mouth. I mean, it goes back to that example. In my home, my children, my wife, they know me better than anybody, right? If I'm not walking with God there, they know it. So I could preach great sermons. I could, I could be doing this and that for God. Everything. Oh man, Pastor Justin, that's great. And my family's going, yeah, whatever. You're a faker because they see it. And God ain't impressed. All that stuff I'm doing out there for God, God knows I'm a sham. That's why pastors have to, have to be managers of their own household, right? Because God's not impressed with great ministry and how it appears to everybody else when your life is a wreck. So what does he want? He wants you to walk with him. He wants your life to display the life of Christ. So back to our theme of gospel fluency, saints. Gospel fluent people, they don't just know the gospel, they live by the gospel. Their lives are shaped by the gospel. They're working out the gospel. They're living in light of the gospel. I like to put it this way. The gospel's not just the door to get in the Christian life, it's the whole path of the Christian life. 
that we would know God. I believe the gospel, and I love the, uh, the book by John Piper, God is the Gospel. Because really, it, when you start to read this book with the lens of gospel, I think you see, wow, this is God's big story, beginning to end. This God who is gracious, merciful, holy, just, who is willing to reconcile sinful men and women to himself. That, that's the gospel, isn't it? All who repent and believe can know forgiveness of their sins. You start reading your Bible with those lenses on, and the Bible's like, the gospel's popping. You're like, whoa, look at, there it is again. There it is again, Old Testament, New Testament. It's all over, cover to cover. This God who is holy, righteous, and good, who is willing to, make, who is willing to reconcile sinners to himself. This good news is everywhere. And the gospel, this gospel truly is the path on which we live, not just the door by which we enter. And so, brothers and sisters, this, this gospel fluency, it cannot ever be reduced to mere information about Jesus. It's actually living for Jesus, a life transformed by Jesus, and Jesus calls that light and darkness. So how are we doing? Does your life display the grace of God so that when you speak about the grace of God, it's evident? And that's my problem with YouTube apologists. They're straight up jerks in the name of Jesus. And God's not interested in jerks in the name of Jesus. That's never what he's, that's not, that's not Jesus' model. It's not Paul's model. We don't, have an ex, we're not, we don't have some free pass to be jerks in the name of Christ. Our lives should ooze the grace of God. As a way of life, we should be living in the light of Christ, displaying the character of Christ. And when that's how we live, guess what? It comes out in how we speak. So when we speak of Christ, they may, not disagree, they may disagree with our message, and they likely will until they repent and believe. But they'll say there's something different about you. And that's called the light of Christ. So as we think about this light, we're going to turn to point number three here and wrap it up. To walk in the light, get this, to walk in the light is to be hated by the darkness. Okay, we have to go there. To walk in the light, not just to preach the light, to walk in the light is to be hated by the darkness. And so at this point, we're going to make something, I hope, clear from the scriptures. That love for, that we, that love for Christ, having a gospel-fluent life, living a life that is transformed by gospel power. This is all true, it's all right, and it's all good. And this is what Christ requires of those who are his followers. But as we live out the light of Christ in a world that hates Christ, that hates the light, you and I will be hated. I know that I've succumbed to this lie in my life. And it goes like this. If I'm just loving enough, people will love me. It sounds good. And it's the ethos of our age. If I'm just kind enough, if I'm just a good person, goodness will come back to me. And so, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna preach that, but man, I really want that to be true. Okay, if I just love my neighbors enough, at some point, they'll want to hear about my Jesus could be true because God uses our examples to soften hearts but light hates darkness so we might be the most gracious kind loving Christ-like people and we're still going to be hated by the darkness in this little book um, again I'm, I'm plugging it hard because it's so worth it Rico Tice um, he is a pastor in England and he talks about how when we're actually going to display the light of Christ, both in our life and in our witness, there's going to come a point, and he calls it the pain point. And I like that. There's going to come a pain point where you will be despised for Christ. Maybe it's because of what you believe, maybe it's because of how you live, and maybe it's because of what you say. And if we live out this light of life, or this life of light for Christ, both in our actions and our words, there's going to come a point that the world will hate you. After all, Jesus did say, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Now again, church, I say this carefully because there are some people in the world, some personality types, and you may be one of them, you have a certain measure of vindicated, vindication when you're hated. That's not the point here. It's not like, yeah, yeah, more people hate me. It's not what we're going for, <laughs> all right? We're not celebrating being hated. I think, again, that kind of runs in the hyper-reform circles. We're not playing that game. We love all people. We should display the Christ-like love of all people. We should lay down our lives for all people. But there will come a point that we will know what this means to be hated by the darkness. Back in John chapter 3, all right? Back in John 3, 
Almost done here, we'll wrap it up. John 3, verse 19. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. This is the quintessential reason for unbelief. There is a reason for unbelief. John 3, 19 and 20 make it clear. All people, including us before we were redeemed, humanity loves sin, and they hate being exposed for the sinners that they are. They love darkness. That's sin. It's why, the, it's why humanity would not repent and believe in Jesus, because Jesus was the light. Did you see it? Their works were evil. Their works are evil. The divine diagnosis by God as to why sinners won't believe in Jesus, it's not, it's not ignorance, it's not lack of opportunity, love of evil. That's it. Now, in our pride, we don't say it that way. So we come up with other reasons, right? Ah, oh, I just, you know, I, oh, it's not, it's, uh, there's all these roads that lead to God, and you've got yours and I've got mine. Okay, that sounds, that sounds more, that sounds more palatable than I love evil, right? Or, hey, you know what, like, I just have time for that right now, I'm too busy. That sounds better than I love evil, right? Or, hey, I'm just not into religion. That's better than I love darkness, right? So God's giving the heart diagnosis of all the excuses that we hear and, frankly, that we gave. We love darkness. We love evil. So why do people reject Jesus? It's never intellectual. It's always moral. Do you guys know uh, Cliff McManus here? Has he been here? Cliff was a, an apologetics professor back in the day, and I stole that from him. Nobody rejects Jesus on intellectual grounds. It's always moral. Every time, John 3, 19 says so. They love darkness. And to come to the light is to submit to him. It is to be exposed at the, at the level of your evilness. And that's why we go back to, we don't argue people into the kingdom of God. We're not just about this, hey, let's study all the different logics and apologetic theories, and if you really master them, you'll get to win the argument, and they'll get saved. No, no, they won't. You'll just make people angry, and they'll walk away angry. At the end of the day, this is, the, this is one of those offenses of the gospel passages all people, God's diagnosis, they love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their, de their deeds are evil. And therefore, they hate the light because the light exposes the darkness. Hear this carefully, saints. Humanity, they're not neutral to Jesus. Because Jesus will expose your spiritual and moral and absolute darkness. And therefore, you will either turn to him or you'll run from him. There's no other options. Right? I mean, and until, until you come to fa saving faith... When the, light is, when the light is turned on, humanity is like cockroaches. We just run for the shade. That's what we do. Ah, light, get out. Run away. Whoa, darkness. Whoo, we're better. Until, until we are going to come to the light to be saved in repentance and faith, we're going to run from the darkness. So I think we need to be clear here, based on Jesus' words, no one's passive to Jesus. Nobody's take it or leave it. Jesus is truly the most polar, polarizing figure in the history of the world. He is. Because he's light, and we're darkness. Gandhi's not polarizing. Mother Teresa's not polarizing. They're not polarizing figures. They just lived. And they did some good things. They're not polarizing. Jesus is polarizing. I mean, even today, in our day of spirituality, we can talk about spirituality all day long. Jesus, whoa, hey, don't get too serious here. Why are you going to be a Bible thumper? Can't we just stay in the broad generalizations of God and spirituality? Why do you got to bring up that guy? I mean, have you ever wondered why no one spends their life campaigning against the Easter Bunny? He's a fictitious, he's a fictitious character that doesn't matter, a hill of beans. And yet there are men and women who passionately hate Jesus and make the, in their entire life's mission to ensure that nobody else ever believes in him, even though they don't think he existed. I'm like, really? Because Santa Claus and Easter Bunny, they didn't exist either, but you leave them alone. Yeah, we don't believe he is. We, we're agnostics, we're atheists, but we're going to campaign till the day we die to prove he didn't exist. It's like, 
Really, what is that? The darkness of our hearts. We love evil. And we make it intellectual, but it's not intellectual because you see the gospel is a gospel of submission to Christ. And that goes back to what we talked about in the last session. It's a submission of I am a sinner before a holy God. I must repent and believe. So darkness cannot tolerate the light. Darkness cannot ignore the light. Due to the simple fact that light and darkness are total opposites, they cannot exist at the same time. They can't. It's, it's literally impossible. When the lights come on, the darkness goes away. And so when Jesus is the light and he exposes darkness, you either the darkness either goes away or the darkness runs and ducks and covers and hides. So there, those lost in the darkness, they can't ignore it. And this is the pain point. This is what Jesus meant, I believe, by taking up your cross. This is the narrow road. This is the sufferings of Christ. That we live in the light and we speak of the light and the darkness either says, thank you, for exposing the darkness, I need the light, or they hate you. Because what are you? You're the light. And you're shining light into their darkness. So brothers and sisters, no matter how nice you are, and by the way, you should be, no matter how kind you are in the name of Jesus, and you should be, no matter how generous you are in the name of Jesus, and you should be, there's going to come a point where the darkness hates the light. And we have to be okay with that. And so brothers and sisters, um, as we think about living on mission, I, I, want us to be, I want us to really make sure that before God, with honesty and with humility, we can say, Lord, thank you. I believe I'm walking in the light of Christ. My life is displaying light. And therefore, when I speak of your light, I'm not a hypocrite. And if not, praise God for the gospel because you can repent and believe and keep walking with Jesus. So this isn't a condemnation. It's just sometimes God, God, when we talk about mission and evangelism and light and darkness, God exposes us and we go, wow, Lord, I've actually not been walking in your light. All right, we know what to do. Run to Jesus. And then say, Lord, help me to live a life that actually looks like your light so that when I speak of your light, at least people will know that I'm the real deal, that your light has transformed me, right? And that our light is actually shining into the darkness. All right, there we go. We're done at 11.02, not 11.07, Chris.